the straight gate or great difficulty of going to heaven plainly proving by the scriptures that not only the rude and profane but many great professors will come short of that kingdom by John Bunyan enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14 to the reader courteous reader God I hope hath put it into my heart to write unto thee another time and that about matters of the greatest moment for now we discourse not about things controverted among the godly but directly about the saving or damning of the soul yea moreover this discourse is about the fewness of them that shall be saved and it proves that many a high professor will come short of eternal life wherefore the matter must needs be sharp and so disliked by some but let it not be rejected by thee the text calls for sharpness so do the times yea the faithful discharge of my duty towards thee hath put me upon it I do not now pipe but mourn it will be well for thee if thou canst graciously lament Matthew 11 verse 17 some say they make the gate of heaven too wide and some make it too narrow. For my part, I have here presented thee with as true a measure of it, as by the word of God I can. Read me, therefore, yea, read me, and compare me with the Bible. And if thou findest my doctrine, and that book of God, concur, embrace it, as thou wilt answer the contrary in the day of judgment. This awakening work, if God will make it so, was prepared for thee. If there be need, and it wounds, get healing by blood. If it disquiets, get peace by blood. If it takes away all thou hast, because it was not, for this book is not prepared to take away true grace from any, then buy of Christ gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness doth not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Revelation 3, verse 18 Self-flatteries, self-deceivings are easy and pleasant, but damnable. The Lord give thee in heart to judge right of thyself, right of this book, and so prepare for eternity, that thou mayest not only expect entrance, but be received into the kingdom of Christ and of God. Amen. So praise thy friend, John Bunyan. The Straight Gate or great difficulty of going to heaven. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Luke thirteen twenty four. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are therefore in a special manner to be heeded. Besides, the subject matter of the words is the most weighty, to wit, how we should obtain salvation, and therefore also to be heeded. The occasion of the words was a question which one that was at this time in the company of the disciples put to Jesus Christ. The question was this, Lord, are there few that be saved? Verse 24. A serious question, not such as tended to the subversion of the hearers, as too many nowadays do, but such as in its own nature tended to the awakening of the company to good, and that called for such an answer that might profit the people also. This question also well pleased Jesus Christ, and he prepareth and giveth such an answer as was without the least retort or show of distaste. Such an answer, I say, as carried in it the most full resolve to answer the question itself and help to the person's questioning. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in, etc. The words are an answer and an instruction also. Number one. An answer, and that in the affirmative. The gate is straight. Many that seek will not be able, therefore but few shall be saved. Number two. The answer is an instruction also. Strive to enter in, etc. Good counsel and instruction. Pray God help me and my reader and all that love their own salvation to take it. My manner of handling the words will be first by way of explication 
and then by way of observation. Roman numeral 1 By way of explication The words are to be considered first with reference to their general scope and then with reference to their several phrases. First, the general scope of the text is to be considered and that is that great thing, salvation. For these words do immediately look at point two and give directions about salvation. Are there few that be saved? Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The words, I say, are to direct us not only to talk of or to wish for, but to understand how we shall and to seek that we may be effectually saved and therefore of the greatest importance. To be saved, what is like being saved? To be saved from sin, from hell, from the wrath of God, from eternal damnation, what is like it? To be made an heir of God, of his grace, of his kingdom and eternal glory, what is like it? And yet all this is included in this word, saved, and in the answer to that question, are there few that be saved? Indeed, this word saved is but of little use in the world except to them that are heartily afraid of damning. This word lies in the Bible as excellent salves lie in some men's houses, thrust into a hole and not fought on for many months because the household people have no wounds nor sores. In time of sickness, what so set by as the doctor's glasses and galley pots full of his excellent things? But when the person is grown well, the rest is thrown to the dunghill. Oh, when men are sick of sin and afraid of damning, what a text is that where this word saved is found? Yea, what a word of worth and goodness and blessedness is it to him that lies continually upon the wrath of a guilty conscience. But the whole need not the physician. He therefore, and he only, knows what saved means, that knows what hell and death and damnation means. What shall I do to be saved is the language of the trembling sinner. Lord, save me, is the language of the sinking sinner. And none admire the glory that is in that word saved, but such as see, without being saved, all things in heaven and earth are emptiness to them. They also that believe themselves privileged in all the blessedness that is wrapped up in that word, bless and admire God that hath saved them. Wherefore, since the thing intended, both in the question and the answer, is no less than the salvation of the soul, I beseech you to give the more earnest heed. Hebrews 21 But to come to the particular phrases in the words and to handle them orderly in the words I find four things. Number one, an intimation of the kingdom of heaven. Two, a description of the entrance into it. Three, an exhortation to enter into it. And four, a motive to enforce that exhortation. Number one, an intimation of the kingdom of heaven. For when he saith, strive to enter in, and in such phrases there is supposed a place or state, or both, to be enjoyed. Enter in, enter into what, or whither, but into a state or place, or both. And therefore when you read this word, enter in, you must say there is certainly included in the text that good thing that yet is not expressed. Enter in, into heaven, that is the meaning, where the saved are, and shall be. Into heaven that place, that glorious place where God and Christ and angels are and the souls or spirits of just men made perfect. Enter in. That thing included, though not expressed in the words, is called in another place the Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12. And therefore the words signify unto us that there is a state most glorious, and that when this world is ended, and that this place and state is likewise to be enjoyed and inherited by a generation of men forever. Besides this word, enter in, signifieth that salvation to the full is to be enjoyed only there, and that there only is eternal safety. All other places and conditions are hazardous, dangerous, full of snares, imperfections, temptations, and afflictions, but there all is well. There is no devil to tempt, no desperately wicked heart to deliver us up, no deceitful lust to entangle, nor any enchanting world to bewitch us. There all shall be well to all eternity. Further, all the parts of and circumstances that attend salvation are only there to be enjoyed. There only is immortality and eternal life. 
There is the glory and fullness of joy and the everlasting pleasures. There is God and Christ to be enjoyed by open vision and more. There are the angels and the saints. Further, there is no death, nor sickness, nor sorrow, nor sighing forever. There is no pain, nor persecutor, nor darkness to eclipse our glory. Oh, this Mount Zion, oh, this heavenly Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 16, verse 11. Luke 20, verses 35 and 36. And Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 14. Behold, therefore, what a great thing the Lord Jesus hath included by this little word, in. In this word is wrapped up an whole heaven and eternal life, even as there is also by other little words in the holy scriptures of truth, as where he saith, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you, and the elect have obtained it. This should teach us not only to read, but to attend in reading, not only to read, but to lift up our hearts to God in reading. For if we be not heedful, if he give us not light and understanding, we may easily pass over without any great regard such a word as may have a glorious kingdom and eternal salvation in the bowels of it. Yea, sometimes as here, a whole heaven is intimated where it is not at all expressed. The apostles of old did use to fetch great things out of the scriptures, even out of the very order and timing of the several things contained therein. See Romans 4 verses 9 through 11. Galatians 3:16 and 17 and Hebrews 8 verse 18. But number 2, as we have here an intimation of the kingdom of heaven, so we have a description of the entrance into it, and that by a double similitude. Number 1, it is called a gate. Number 2, a straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. First, it is set forth by the similitude of a gate. A gate, you know, is of double use. It is to open and shut, and so consequently to let in or keep out, and to do both these at the season, as he said, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened till the sun be hot. And again, I commanded that the gate should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. Nehemiah 7 verse 3 and chapter 13 verses 19 and 20 And so you find of this gate of heaven, when the five wise virgins came, the gate was opened, but afterwards came the other virgins, and the door was shut. Matthew 11 So then the entrance into heaven is called a gate, to show that there is a time when there may be entrance, and there will come a time when there shall be none. And indeed this is a chief truth contained in that text. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. I read in the scriptures of two gates or doors through which they that go to heaven must enter. Number one, there is the door of faith, the door which the grace of God hath opened to the Gentiles. This door is Jesus Christ, as also himself doth testify, saying, I am the door, and etc. Acts chapter 14, verse 27, and John 10, verse 9. By this door men enter into God's favor and mercy and find forgiveness through faith in his blood and live in hope of eternal life. And therefore himself also said, I am the door. By me if any man enter in he shall be saved. That is, receive to mercy and inherit eternal life. But, number two, there is another door or gate. For that which is called in the text a gate is twice in the next verse called a door. That is, I say, another gate and that is the passage into the very heaven itself, the entrance into the celestial mansion house. And that is the gate mentioned in the text, and the door mentioned twice in the verse that follows. And thus Jacob called it when he said, Bethel was the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven, that is the entrance, for he saw the entrance into heaven. One end of Jacob's ladder stands in Bethel, God's house, and the other end reaches up to the gate of heaven. Genesis 28 verses 10 through 18 Jacob's ladder was the figure of Christ which ladder was not the gate of heaven but the way from the church to that gate which he saw above at the top of the ladder Genesis 28 verse 12 and John chapter 1 verse 51 But again that the gate in the text is the gate or entrance into heaven consider number one 
It is that gate that letteth men into, or shutteth men out of that place or kingdom where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is, which place is that paradise where Christ promised the thief that he should be that day, that he asked to be with him in his kingdom. It is that place into which Paul said he was caught when he heard words unlawful or impossible for a man to utter. Luke 13, verse 20, and chapter 23, verse 24, and 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 6. Question. But is not Christ the gate or entrance into this heavenly place? Answer. He is he without whom no man can get thither, because by his merits men obtain that world and also because he, as the Father, is the donor and disposer of that kingdom to whom he will. Further, this place is called his house, and himself the master of it. When once the master of the house is risen up, and has shut the door, verse 25. But we used to say that the master of the house is not the door. Men enter into heaven, then, by him, not as he is the gate or door or entrance, into the celestial mansion house, but as he is the giver and disposer of that kingdom to them whom he shall count worthy because he hath obtained it for them. Number two, that this gate is the very passage into heaven. Consider the text hath special reference to the day of judgment when Christ will have laid aside his mediatory office which before he exercised for the bringing to the faith his own elect and will then act not as one that justifieth the ungodly but as one that judges sinners. He will now be risen up from the throne of grace and shut up the door against all the impenitent and will be set upon the throne of judgment from thence to proceed with ungodly sinners. Objection But Christ bids strive. Strive now to enter in at the straight gate. But if that gate be, as you say, the gate or entrance into heaven, then it should seem that we should not strive till the day of judgment, for we shall not come at that gate till then. Answer Christ, by this exhortation, strive, etc., doth not at all admit of, or continuance delays, or that a man should neglect his own salvation, but putteth poor creatures upon preparing for the judgment, and counsels them now to get those things that will then give them entrance into glory. This exhortation is much like these. Be ye therefore ready also, for at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Matthew 24, 44, and 25, verse 10. So that when he saith, Strive to enter in, it is as much as if he should say, Blessed are they that shall be admitted another day to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they that shall be accounted worthy of so unspeakable a favor must be well prepared and fitted for it beforehand. Now the time to be fitted is not the day of judgment, but the day of grace. Not then, but now. Therefore strive now for those things that will then give you entrance into the heavenly kingdom. But secondly, as it is called a gate, so it is called a straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The straightness of this gate is not to be understood carnally, but mystically. You are not to understand it as if the entrance into heaven was some little pinching wicket. No, the straightness of this gate is quite another thing. This gate is wide enough for all them that are the truly gracious and sincere lovers of Jesus Christ, but so straight as that not one of the other can by any means enter in. Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Psalm 118, verses 19 and 20. By this word, therefore, Christ Jesus has showed unto us that without due qualifications there is no possibility of entering into heaven. The straight gate will keep all others out. When Christ spake this parable, he had doubtless his eye upon some passage or passages of the Old Testament with which the Jews were well acquainted. I will mention two, and so go on. Number one the place by which God turned Adam and his wife out of paradise. Possibly our Lord might have his eye upon that, for though that was wide enough for them to come out at, yet it was too straight for them to go in at. But what should the reason of that be? Why they had sinned, and therefore God set at the east of that garden cherubims and a flaming sword, turning every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.24 The cherubims and this flaming sword they made the entrance too straight for them to enter in. 
souls there are cherubims and a flaming sword at the gates of heaven to keep the way of the tree of life. Therefore none but them that are duly fitted for heaven can enter in at this straight gate. The flaming sword will keep all others out. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 Number 2 Perhaps our Lord might have his eye upon the gates of the temple when he spoke this word unto the people. For though the gates of the temple were six cubits wide, yet they were so straight that none that were unclean in anything might enter in thereat. Ezekiel 40 verse 48 Because there were placed at them gates porters whose office was to look that none but those that had right to enter might go in thither. And so it is written, Joadiah set porters at the gates of the house of the Lord, that none that were unclean in anything might enter in. Second Chronicles 23 verse 19 Souls, God hath porters at the gates of the temple, at the gate of heaven. Porters, I say, placed there by God, to look that none that are unclean in anything may come in thither. In at the gate of the church none may enter now that are open, profane and scandalous to religion no though they plead they are beloved of God what hath my beloved to do in mine house saith the Lord seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many Jeremiah 11 verse 15 I say I am very apt to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ had his thoughts upon these two texts when he said the gate is straight and that which confirms me the more in this thing is this A little below the text he saith, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of heaven, and you yourselves thrust out. Verse 28. Thrust out, which signifies a violent act, resisting with striving those that would, though unqualified, enter. The porters of the temple were, for this very thing, to wear arms, if need were, and to be men of courage and strength, lest the unsanctified or unprepared should by some means enter in. We read in the book of Revelations of the holy city, and that it had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. But what did they do there? Why, amongst the rest of their service, this was one thing, that there might in no wise enter in anything that defileth, or worketh abomination, and that maketh a lie. Revelation 21 verses 12 and 21 But more particularly to show what it is that maketh this gate so straight there are three things that maketh it straight Number one there is sin Number two there is the word of the law Number three there are the angels of God First there is sin the sin of the profane and the sin of the professor Number one the sin of the profane But this needs not be enlarged upon, because it is concluded upon at all hands where there is the common belief of the being of God and the judgment to come, that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, verse 17. Number 2. But there is the sin of professors, or take it rather thus, there is a profession that will stand with an unsanctified heart and life. The sin of such will overpoise the salvation of their souls, the sin end being the heaviest end of the scale. I say that being the heaviest end which hath sin in it, they tilt over, and so are notwithstanding their glorious profession, drowned in perdition and destruction. For none such hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Therefore let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience neither will a profession be able to excuse them. Ephesians 5 verses 3 through 6 The gate will be too straight for such as these to enter in thereat. A man may partake of salvation in part, but not of salvation in whole. God saved the children of Israel out of Egypt, but overthrew them in the wilderness. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not. So we see that notwithstanding their beginning, they could not enter in because of unbelief. 
Jude 5 and Hebrews 3 verse 19. Secondly, there is the word of the law, and that will make the gate straight also. None must go in thereat, but those that can go in by the leave of the law. For though no man be, or can be, justified by the works of the law, yet unless the righteousness and holiness by which they attempt to enter into this kingdom be justified by the law, it is in vain once to think of entering in at this straight gate. Now the law justifieth not, but upon the account of Christ's righteousness. If therefore thou be not indeed found in that righteousness, thou wilt find the law lie just in the passage into heaven to keep thee out. Every man's work must be tried by fire, that it may be manifest of what sort it is. There are two errors in the world about the law. One is, when men think to enter in at the straight gate by the righteousness of the law. The other is, when men think they may enter into heaven without the leave of the law. Both these, I say, are errors. For as by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified, so without the consent of the law no flesh shall be saved. Heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or tittle of the law shall fail, till all be fulfilled. He therefore must be damned that cannot be saved by the consent of the law. And indeed this law is the flaming sword that turneth every way, yea, that lieth to this day in the way to heaven, for a bar to all unbelievers and unsanctified professors. For it is taken out of the way for the truly gracious only. It will be found as a roaring lion to devour all others. Because of the law, therefore, the gate will be found too straight for the unsanctified to enter in. When the apostle had told the Corinthians that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God, and that such were some of them, he adds, But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9-11 closely concluding that had they not been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, the law for their transgressions would have kept them out. It would have made the gate too straight for them to enter in. Thirdly, there are also the angels of God, and by reason of them the gate is straight. The Lord Jesus calleth the end of the world his harvest, and saith, moreover, that the angels are his reapers, these angels are therefore to gather his wheat into his barn, but to gather the ungodly into bundles to burn them. Matthew 13, verses 39, 41, and 49. Unless therefore the man that is unsanctified can master the law and conquer angels, unless he can, as I may say, pull them out of the gateway of heaven, himself is not to come thither forever. No man goeth to heaven but by the help of the angels, I mean at the day of judgment. For the Son of Man shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. If those that shall enter in at the straight gate shall only enter in thither by the conduct of holy angels, pray when do you think those men will enter in thither concerning whom the angels are commanded to gather them, to bind them in bundles, to burn them? This therefore is a third difficulty. The angels will make this entrance straight, yea, too straight for the unjustified and unsanctified to enter in thither. Number three. I come now to the exhortation which is to strive to enter in. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. These words are fitly added, for since the gate is straight, it follows that they who will enter in must strive. Strive. This word strive supposes, number one, that great idleness is natural to professors. They think to get to heaven by lying, as it were, on their elbows. Number two, it also suggests that many will be the difficulties that professors will meet with before they get to heaven. Number three, it also concludes that only the laboring Christian, man or woman, will get in thither, strive, etc. Three questions I will propound upon the word, an answer to which may give us light into the meaning of it. Number one, what does the word strive import? How should we strive? And three, why should we strive? Number one, what does this word strive import? Answer, when he saith strive, it is as much to say, bend yourselves to the work with all your might. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, 
nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Thus Samson did when he set himself to destroy the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might. Judges 16 verse 30 Thus David did also when he made provision for the building and beautifying of the temple of God. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 2 And thus must thou do if ever thou enterest into heaven. Secondly, when he saith strive, he calleth for the mind and will that they should be on his side and on the side of the things of his kingdom. For none strive indeed, but such as have given the Son of God their heart, of which their mind and will are a principal part. For saving conversion lieth more in the turning of the mind and will to Christ and to the love of his heavenly things than in all knowledge and judgment. And this the apostle confirms when he saith, Stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving, etc. Philippians 1, 27. Number 3. And more particularly, this word strive is expressed by several other terms. As number 1, it is expressed by that word, So run that you may obtain. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. Number 2. It is expressed by that word, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Number 3. It is expressed by that word, Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that meat that endureth to everlasting life. John 6, 27. Number 4. It is expressed by that word, We wrestle with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Therefore when he saith, Strive, it is as much as to say, Run for heaven, fight for heaven, labor for heaven, wrestle for heaven, or you are like to go without it. The second question is, how should we strive? Answer. The answer in general is, thou must strive lawfully. And if a man also strive for the mastery, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. 2 Timothy 6. But will you say, what is it to strive lawfully? Answer. Number one. To strive against the things which are abhorred by the Lord Jesus. Yea, to resist to the spilling of your blood, striving against sin. Hebrews 12, verse 4. To have all those things that are condemned by the word. Yea, though they be thine own right hand, right eye, or right foot, in abomination. And to seek by all godly means the utter suppressing of them. Mark 9, verses 43, 45, and 47. Number 2. To strive lawfully is to strive for those things that are commanded in the word. But thou, O man of God, fly the world and follow after, that is, strive for, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, etc. 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12. Number 3. He that striveth lawfully must be therefore very temperate in all the good and lawful things of this life. And everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 9.25 Most professors give leave to the world and the vanity of their hearts to close with them and to hang about their necks and make their striving to stand rather in an outcry of words than a hearty labor against the lusts and love of the world and their own corruptions. But this kind of striving is but a beating of the air and will come to just nothing at last. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 Number 4 He that striveth lawfully must take God in Christ along with him to the work, otherwise he will certainly be undone. Whereunto, said Paul, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Colossians 1, 29 And for the right performing of this, he must observe these following particulars. Number one, he must take heed that he doth not strive about things or words to no profit, for God will not then be with him. Of these things, saith the apostle, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. 1 Timothy 2.14 But alas, how many professors in our days are guilty of this transgression, 
whose religion stands chiefly, if not only, in a few unprofitable questions and vain wranglings about words and things to no profit but to the destruction of the hearers. Number two. He must take heed that while he strives against one sin, he does not harbor and shelter another, or that while he cries out against other men's sins, he does not countenance his own. Number three. In the striving, strive to believe, strive for the faith of the gospel. For the more we believe the gospel and the reality of the things of the world to come, with the more stomach and courage shall we labor to possess the blessedness. Philippians 1.27 and Hebrews chapter 4 Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Number 4 As we should strive for and by faith, so we should strive by prayer. Romans 15 verse 30 By fervent and effectual prayers. O the swarms of our prayerless professors, what do they think of themselves? Surely the gate of heaven was heretofore as wide as in these our days. But what striving by prayer was there then among Christians for the thing that gives admittance into this kingdom over what there is in these latter days? Number five. We should also strive by mortifying our members that are upon the earth. I therefore so run, said Paul, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached the gospel to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9.27 But all this is spoken principally to professors, so I would be understood. I come now to the third question, namely, but why should we strive? Answer number one. Because the thing for which you are here exhorted to strive is worth the striving for. It is for no less than for all the whole heaven and an eternity of felicity there. How will men that have before them a little honor, a little profit, a little pleasure strive? I say again, how will they strive for this? Now they do it for a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Methinks this word heaven and this eternal life ought verily to make us strive, for what is there again either in heaven or earth like them to provoke a man to strive? Number two. Strive because otherwise the devil and hell will assuredly have thee. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5 verse 8. These fallen angels, they are always watchful, diligent, unwearied. They are also mighty, subtle, and malicious, seeking nothing more than the damnation of thy soul. O thou that art like the heartless dove, strive. Number three. Strive because every lust strives and wars against thy soul. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, said Peter, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Galatians 5 verse 17 It is a rare thing to see or find out a Christian that indeed can bridle his lust, but no strange thing to see such professors that are not only bridled, but saddled too, yea, and ridden from lust to sin, from one vanity to another, by the very devil himself and the corruptions of their hearts. Number four. Strive, because thou hast a whole world against thee, the world hateth thee if thou be a Christian. The men of the world hate thee. The things of the world are snares for thee. Even thy bed and table, thy wife and husband, yea, the most lawful enjoyments, have that in them that will certainly sink thy soul to hell, if thou dost not strive against the snares that are in them. Romans 11 verse 9 The world will seek to keep thee out of heaven with mocks, flounts, taunts, threatenings, goals, gibbets, altars, burnings, and a thousand deaths. Therefore, strive. Again, if it cannot overcome thee with these, it will flatter, promise, allure, entice, entreat, and use a thousand tricks on this hand to destroy thee. And observe, many that have been stout against the threats of the world have yet been overcome with the bewitching flatteries of the same. There ever was enmity between the devil and the church, and betwixt his seed and her seed too, Michael and his angels, and the dragon and his angels, these make war continually. Genesis 3 and Revelation chapter 12. 
There hath been great desires and endeavors among men to reconcile these two in one, to wit the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, but it could never yet be accomplished. The world says they will never come over to us, and we again say, by God's grace, we will never come over to them. But the business hath not ended in words. Both they and we have also added our endeavors to make each other submit, but endeavors have proved ineffectual too. They, for their part, have devised all manner of cruel torments to make us submit, as slaying with the sword, stoning, sawing asunder, flames, wild beasts, banishments, hunger, and a thousand miseries. We again on the other side have labored by prayers and tears, by patience and long-suffering, by gentleness and love, by sound doctrine and faithful witness-bearing against their enormities to bring them over to us. But yet the enmity remains, so that they must conquer us or we must conquer them. One side must be overcome, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God.